a networking session in the end. So if you have any questions, you will have the opportunity to ask them by approaching one of the speakers. Right now, uh, we will uh, move forward to another session, uh, which is called FinTech in Lending and Investing. How does the future look? And I would like to introduce our moderator for today, associate from Sarayan in Lithuania, Arturas Asakavičius. Hello, everyone. So thank you for introducing me. Uh, I'm also co-heading Sorainen Startup Practice Group, and I'm responsible for the fintech sector at our law firm. I'm very happy to see so many people in Lithuania interested in fintech, and a lot of people working to make the country a leading jurisdiction in the fintech sector. Also, I'm happy that a lot of foreign companies already started exploring opportunities Lithuania can offer. Some of those companies already moved the business to Lithuania. From my own experience, which is related to re regulation, licensing, and the uh, regulator itself, I can say that, uh, honestly, Lithuania is uh, like a fintech startup. It's innovative, very fast growing, immediately adopting decisions, taking actions, including elimination of uh, regulatory obstacles that were made in the past. So I'm so I want to say thank you for the Ministry of Finance and the Bank of Lithuania for doing that. And on behalf of Sorainen, let me say that uh, we, we are proud to be part of this initiative to work for our country. And uh, I would like to wish you uh, to have a wonderful afternoon and especially to have fun, meet people here. This is all about the conference. So during this session, we will talk about fintech in lending and investing. This is a very hot topic, especially in Lithuania, uh, because this month, I, ho I hope so, we will have finally the law on crowdfunding, which will uh, provide our market with new investing and lending opportunities. How does the future look like? Five people from different crowdfunding platforms, from different regulatory environments, uh, today will share their thoughts thoughts and uh, experience, and I hope that they will share their advice to Lithuania to become the central hub for, especially for the Baltics. Without spending time, let's start, and I'm asking you to, play, to give a huge round of applause to our first speaker, Jeva Vishnauskaita, representing crowdfunding platform Brick Invest, United Kingdom. Yes, and um, I'm, again, very glad to be here. It seems that Vilnius is, um, and especially fintech scene in Vilnius, is picking up um, quite rapidly. Um, so what I'll do here, um, I'll present Breakfast, um, the company I'm representing for a little bit. Then I'll talk a little bit about crowdfunding and trends um, in regards to the niche that Breakfast occupies and um, touch upon regulatory environment a little bit. Um, so, um, Brickvest, I'm not sure if, if you, it should be. Okay, okay. So, uh, Brickfest is, um, we are calling ourselves uh, the first um, global online real estate investment platform, um, or in other words, crowdfunding platform. Um, and uh, essentially, it is um, an investment platform just for commercial um, real estate opportunities. Um, its target market um, is uh, currently uh, professional investors under Mifid, and I'll explain later what it is, or family offices and high net uh, worth individuals. Um, as all crowdfunding platforms, the value proposition obviously is easiness of sort of use of the platform 
um, low uh, transparencies, uh, transparent opportunities, and in terms of commercial and real estate opportunities, um, this is the first platform in Europe that allows to directly invest into commercial real estate opportunities um, with a relatively low minimum amount. So Brickfest requires only 1,000 euros or 1,000 GBP into certain, um, certain um, properties and, and portfolios. So I'll explain how it works. So BrickWest um, works with really experienced real estate sponsors um, that actually source and present to us uh, real estate opportunities. Uh, we have an investment team and investment uh, committee that selects these opportunities. And uh, then we present these to investors. And as I mentioned, these are mostly family offices and high net worth individuals currently. And to give you an example, um, the deal could be, let's say, 10 million or 20 million, and BrickVest gets a tranche of 500,000. And the other investors are uh, large institutional um, investors such as Goldman Sachs or Morgan Stanley Investment Management, Alternative Investment Management, et cetera. Uh, the sponsors do partner with us um, and see us as a strategic partnership presently, just uh, because this is just a very new platform and a new way I would say of working. Um, just uh, to give you an overview, um, um, this is again, as I said, direct real estate. Most of you probably invest in REITs or investment funds that are not as transparent um, and easy to understand. Um, this is um, just to show a little bit where we invest. So currently it's just um, primary or secondary um, cities in Europe, uh, unfortunately not yet in Lithuania or the Baltics or the Nordics. Um, this is due to our investor appetite and perhaps um, also understanding of returns and risks in these sort of regions. Um, and just to give you an example of uh, current few deals, uh, so this is uh, something, an, uh, an office building in primary location in Berlin. Um, this deal is already closed, but I just gave you an example because nothing like that exists in Europe so far. So it was uh, a million deal and, um, I'm sorry, a 10 million deal and request uh, resold a tranche of 400,000 um, Euro, uh, euros to, to family offices or our investors. Um, so I'll just a little bit touch on um, sort of benefits of these sort of platforms uh, um, crowdfunding platforms for investors overall and, and for sponsors. So for sponsors, real estate sponsors, also, of course it's access to capital and ability to raise funds quickly. Um, but in terms of BrickVest, we do work with really experienced sponsors, so for them it's not really a problem to raise capital. Uh, this is seen more of a strategic partnership going forward. And for investors, um, I do believe um, this is geared for someone who wants to tailor their investment portfolio by themselves. So sometimes you would invest, you know, your money into SCBs, web bank funds, etc. And or you know you use Fidelity Vanguard and ETFs, and you don't know where your money goes. Whereas here you actually select your um, your property and you own that shares in that fund that owns the property, and hence you allocate your portfolio. Um, in terms of risk return corrects as you see fit. Um, and of course, to gain access into real estate, you cannot presently probably buy an office building in, in Germany, but here you can buy a fund um, which is an, an attractive return and pre-vetted sort of real estate quite easily. Um, so VR request is based in the UK. And uh, to talk about the regulatory requirements and issues, um, to launch this platform is rather easy, I would say, from a regulatory perspective. You can go the direct route, or the second one, you can use or employ the so-called appointed representative regime, regime in the UK, and essentially rent the regulatory permissions from another firm. Um, and this is a very expensive route, but this is one of the, the roads that actually BrickFest took, and I can tell you we are I mean, the cost can range from 10 to 20,000 GBP per month, which is for a startup 
kind of it, it's expensive, but you are essentially renting out another firm's um, regulatory permissions. And there, if something goes wrong, if there is fraud, they're taking all the responsibility. To get direct authorization, yes, you apply, and currently Brickfest is applying for that route, and we are author to be authorized in about two or three weeks. Um, this is a process which takes about three to six months, and, and it looks, the FCA, the regulator looks at the team, and um, you know, the resources and capabilities. Um, and it, uh, it is, um, it is a difficult platform to launch this particular platform. Is, it is difficult to launch just because of actually real estate specifics. So most of the deals, if you think about it, they are not, they are actually pre-funded right away. So it's not that you go online and you're waiting for someone to, to put in money. Actually, we do have other venture capital investors into the company that are pre-funding the deal and then we resell it as a secondary market. So if it's a 500,000 deal, um, someone else has to buy and put this into the sponsor pockets. And if it's a hot real estate market, no one, no really experienced sponsor would just give you a deal to wait online for three months. So this probably does not apply to a lot of equity crowdfunding, but this applies to um, high quality real estate. Um, so to go for going forward, I do believe Brickfest has a future. Um, this is probably um, these sort of platforms will scale up quite quickly, but this will be meant for investors that want to tailor their portfolios. And um, this definitely is not meant for someone who would just put money into, let's say, Fidelity or ETFs and would be glad to just you know kind of watch them. Um, and recheck every three to five years. That's it. Thank you. If you have any questions, let me know. Please, Do we have any questions from the audience? So I have one. Okay. <laughs> so the conference is about how Lithuania sees its future in the fintech, right? Yeah. And you're you're coming from UK. You are working with UK regulator. You are working in UK environment. So please tell us, because we understand that the structure is very difficult and a lot of mm -hmm. expenses, a lot of different laws, also laws with some real estate rela related things. So tell us how the regulator in UK helps you, or if it doesn't help you, what kind of help you would like to get? Because now the the regulator is like taking notes here. So please. Uh, okay. Um, I would say the regulator, um, the main help that I sort of mentioned is that two routes to authorization. Yes, you pay more, but you can launch the, you know, the platform rather quickly. And it's sort of like a egg and chicken situation because, um, um, Yes, you can be directly authorized, but then still you have to wait for six months and be employing people and actually have capital requirements, whereas having this appointed representative regime, yes, you, you pay money, but you can actually operate, and you operate completely authorized, everything is safe and transparent. Um, uh, the, uh, this is sort of in the UK laws, is, 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 is very sort of transparent and convenient. Um, and. Uh, as we are undergoing the application process, I can, uh, for these particular platforms, um, the actually vetting is very thorough, um, but the, I would say the questions and the checkups of um, the expertise of our team is, is very reasonable, transparent, and uh, rather timely. So um, I would say that we are happy with the regulator and, and this is sort of the help that they can provide. The only thing that I could say is a really big burden for these sort of firms is the know your customer anti-money laundering checks, um, which um, just it's a really a lot of operational sort of work for these smaller companies. And this is something to be improved, I would say, in, in the UK and probably in the Europe overall. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you, Yeva, and our next speaker is Lasse Makella, founder and CEO of uh, cross-border equity crowdfunding platform, Investor, Finland.
good luck. <laughs> Just let, let's wait for a second. Yeah. About investor, and then about um, the the regulatory side. Uh, what we have, what, what are our experiences uh, on that field? My background is is such. I, I studied in year '97 as an investment banker uh, at Merrill Lynch in London, uh, doing uh, IPOs, equity offerings, all kinds of capital raisings. Uh, was about four years there, uh, looking at l looking at that market. Then came back to Helsinki, where I'm from. Uh, I was a partner in a, in a boutique there uh, uh, called Ice Capital Securities for four years, doing the same kind of work. After that, I was running the uh, uh, M&A department of Connect Corporation, the elevator escalator business um, uh, on, on that field, and then after a few other other companies. But my why that's relevant is that um, every time uh, in my professional career before, when you were doing fundraising, it was always complex and difficult, and uh, and there was a lot of extra lawyers, a lot of extra bankers. Sorry, uh, lawyers are still needed, but uh, <laughs> but maybe in different kind of capacity. Um, but there, there were a lot of people just standing uh, around the tables, and and why we came up with the idea of uh, investor is that, I mean, we should make this easy. We should make it transparent. Uh, we should make it uh, quick and uh, and sort of transparent, uh, well, uh, cheaper as well, and that's pretty much what it was. Um, so that's that's how we came up with uh, with investor, and then basically who we are. We are a market leader uh, in the Nordic region in the equity crowdfunding space. Um, we started in uh, 2012, been operating uh, four and a half years uh, in in that field. We've helped. Uh, I think there is about more than 2,000 companies have applied to our service. Uh, 145 companies roughly has raised funding so far, and there is about 66 um, successful uh, equity offerings. Uh, our sort of success rate is about 60% currently uh, in the uh, uh, of the companies who raise funding, they get funding. Uh, uh, what we do is we do uh, equities and bonds, and if you compare to the traditional world, we're basically investment bank. We are doing what broker dealers are doing, what the investment banks are doing, raising funding for listed and non-listed shares, uh, non-listed companies. And actually, what is what is relevant here is the the Mifid investment firm license. Um, we have applied and we have the license. I think we were the first one in Europe uh, of the equity crowdfunding platforms who uh, received this fully passportable MIFID license. Um, and we have passported that now to 28 countries in Europe. Our team, uh, very international. We have people from five different nations, uh, UK, Sweden, Finland, um, Ukraine, and who else? Uh, from, was that it? About uh, somewhere there? Uh, Italy as well, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. And here a little bit the European framework, um, what we've, uh, how we, what are our experience, experiences about crowdfunding in Europe. Um, when crowdfunding started in 2011, 12, um, the regulators were coming slowly uh, to the picture and started to follow uh, what's happening there. And then there a lot of, there's a lot of talk in European uh, EU level about regulating crowdfunding. Uh, we are also members of European, uh, um, what's it called, crowdfunding network. Uh, one of our, our chairman is the, the member of the ECN's board as well. And we're, we've been trying to lobby a lot to, to Brussels about crowdfunding, how it should be done, but nothing really has happened. And therefore, a lot of the local uh, uh, member states have started to do their own crowdfunding laws. And uh, Finland uh, recently launched their own uh, crowdfunding law. But I, I think those are always good, good laws, and especially in UK, that's been working well because in UK, it's, the market is so large. So you sort of you just operate in UK mostly, in if, if you have the exemption two of the MIFID uh, license there. Uh, but uh, but often you then offer the shares to the UK general public unless you, they are then professional, and then you can go with a different different routes. Um, but but the, I think the the problem for the cross border. Uh, is that if you have these local laws, they all look different, and you don't really have a coherent 
system. And therefore, what we think is that NIFID license, what we have done and we, we have gone after, that is still the best solution for cross-border aspects. Uh, although it's a heavy, heavy one, but uh, it is, we, we feel that that is still the best, best option there. Just the, the setup, how we are set up now. Uh, so we have the MIFID license from Helsinki. Uh, we have uh, notified 28 countries. Um, we can now accept companies from uh, all the Nordic countries and the UK. Uh, investors can come, come anywhere around the world. Um, and we can work with listed and unlisted uh, companies, with, uh, including IPOs. We've been in two IPOs uh, so far as a, uh, as a subscription place. And uh, we also, uh, this, this year, we've signed at least one. We are hopefully launching one in uh, this month, where we're going to be the only subscription place for the, for the, for the IPO. So it's an interesting uh, uh, situation where we start to step on the old investment bankers uh, turf. We're headquartered in Helsinki. We have a branch office in uh, London. We have an uh, office in Morgate. Um, and we're opening a branch in Copenhagen. So just uh, still about the regulatory side, uh, what, what's, what's a little bit the, the theme here. Um, so, I mean, well, pretty much what I said already as a summary. So it, it is a complex um, situation in terms of capital raising. And if you, and the, and the problem here is still that it's, it's quite unfair against the smaller countries. Myself coming from Finland, we have five million people, um, and sort of if, if you only operate in Finland, the market is too small, and it, you, you need to go cross-border right away, and then you have to go right away to the MIFID world, otherwise it's not really legal. Um, so, but if you, are, if you are based in UK, uh, your market is big, and you can actually operate there for a long time. So it's, uh, I'm, I'm whining here because I'm coming from the small country, but <laughs> that's basically how it is. Um, uh, but uh, what else? So, so I think still the, the MIFID is the, 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 the key thing, but uh, um, as a maybe as a, let's say, a message or, or maybe help to the, uh, um, uh, uh, to the, the, the country who is now, if you are now thinking about the crowdfunding law, so uh, I think one thing which would help a lot is that, um, I mean, if you are looking at the uh, MIFID uh, jurisdiction, the financial regulator can always look at it uh, more sort of like string, string uh, how, how do you say, like uh, very toughly or a little bit more openly. And I think the, I mean, I guess my recommendation is that if you look at it a little bit more openly uh, and think about the possibilities, what, what it, what it uh, brings. So I think that is going to be a key uh, to get uh, the, the, uh, these capital flows uh, going cross-border as well. So that's all I, I wanted to say. Thank you. Uh, we ourselves, we don't have one yet. Um, you need to have a, I mean, you have to, if you have the MTF, uh, what's it called, the uh, multilateral trading facility license, at least in Finland, you need to have 730,000 as an own capital. But we have the 125,000, so we can receive transmit orders, uh, arrange equity offerings, and give financial advice. But we don't have ourselves the market yet, but we have a partner. Uh, we have a partner called Trivanet. Uh, we opened the market, um, I think it was three years ago. Uh, there's now six or seven companies which are trading uh, on the secondary market. They are running basically markets for non-listed shares. And we give an option for our companies if they want to trade there. Um, there may be some changes coming later that we, we may be providing a better secondary market, but currently Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's always in, it, it is in the investment materials. You always tell whether the company is going to be listed or not. Uh, I mean, as I said earlier, there's been two 
uh, IPOs, uh, one of the Sealy solutions uh, in the up, upper left-hand corner. So they were in their first north NASDAQ, and then they moved to the main list NASDAQ, and they used our platform as a subscription place for that. So, I mean, clearly in the materials you say exactly what's happening, where they are going. And if you are non-listed, you always say there also whether you are going to the market or not. But most of the cases which have raised funding through us, they, there is no secondary market. And uh, of course, the, I mean, our recommendation for the investors is always that risks are high. I mean, one third goes bankrupt, uh, one third maybe you get the money back, one third maybe successful. And with the successful ones, you probably cover hopefully at least all the costs and make a little bit on top of that as well. So we, we are very open about the risks uh, uh, that are involved. Yeah, so MIFID 2 is coming uh, soon. It was supposed to come already, like, quite fast, but it's, it's coming a little bit later, I think, after one year. Or, yeah, yeah, one year, I don't know, five months or something. But um, so what is interesting about MIFID 2 is that uh, there's no exemption. I don't remember now exactly the, was it the exemption 3 or... Uh, of the MIFID 2, I think is the, 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 the wording there. So um, at least in Finland, the crowdfunding law, which has now come to the force, it's using this exemption. And I think UK uh, is also using this exemption 3. And in the MIFID 2, that exemption is going to be wiped away. So basically it means that this kind, if, if the crowdfunding law, the, the uh, sort of local crowdfunding law is based on the exemption three, uh, it may go away after 2018. So everybody has to apply for the MIFID if you want to do public offerings. There may be still changes coming, there may be still uh, things coming up, but uh, the current setup, how I understand it, that's, that's the situation. But for us, it doesn't really make a difference because we are already in the MIFID world. So if you don't have any other questions, I have one also. Okay. <laughs> Liza, we know each other for a while. Yeah. And each time we speak or meet, I, I'm always asking the same question. So when is Lithuania? When are you <laughs> opening something here? Yeah, I mean... Um, and, and feel the pressure right now. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> I think what, what, uh, what I've been always saying is that, I mean, uh, uh, to be honest, I don't, I don't know so well Lithuania yet. But I, I think this is a great uh, possibility now to be here and meet, meet a lot of people here. Um, I think it's always the question about the uh, resources on our side. We are now, we have 17 people. We are spread thin in uh, the five countries that we are operating in. Uh, so it's the question of whether we find good, uh, great people who could actually take the Lithuanian market completely using our platform, our, our systems. Uh, 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 but, but the problem is that we just don't have enough resources for the marketing, for the, uh, all, all, all this kind of sort of back office uh, uh, situation. So um, let's say if, if there is, um, um, uh, well, there, there's a lot of things happening on the, on the equity crowdfunding market at the moment. There's about 300 players uh, in Europe, I think, and there's going to be the big consolidation wave coming. Um, and the question is who's going to survive, basically. And, uh, and I think when that is coming, so it's an interesting to see how that plays out and what are the resources of people who are doing what kind of moves. So um, I, I think at some point there will be, uh, uh, I think we will be some, one way or the other here uh, later. <laughs> Thank you. So now please welcome Mats Emil Dalsgaard. A Danish representing Estonian equity crowdfunding platform, Funderby. Good luck. <laughs> That's not my company. <laughs> That's the wrong slide. <laughs> um, yeah, I can just start out by introducing myself. My name is Massimil. Uh, I'm the CMO at Funderbeam, which is a company based in Tallinn, Estonia. Uh, legal headquarter is in the UK, and we are moving towards the 
UK market. Uh, the short and sweet description of Funderbeam is that we are the place where growth companies are funded and traded across borders. Uh, and this one works. Ta -da. Uh, so basically, our business consists of three parts. Uh, we have a data product uh, where we provide free data intelligence uh, on 180,000 uh, startups and investors because we believe that in order to make uh, good informed investment decisions you need access to quality data um, and the second part is we have a funding platform kind of similar to, to Investor uh, where we allow investors to, to back uh, great growth companies uh, through syndicated uh, investing uh, open crowdfunding or closed syndicates um, and what's, what's unique about Funderbeam is that we have, for all startups that raise on Funderbeam, uh, they are trading on the secondary market, uh, which is built on top of blockchain technology. Uh, and since July, this is up and running uh, live. We have three companies right now. Uh, the first three companies that have raised on Funderbeam, they are already trading. Uh, and the total trade volumes in this first uh, little less than three months, it's been around 26,000 euros. Um, and I was asked to talk a bit about uh, kind of the, the market in general um, in, in Estonia. Um, and as, as uh, Mindaugas uh, pointed out, I hope I'm saying that right, pointed out earlier, it's been, it's been quite recently, it's been slowing down a lot uh, in, in terms of, of VC capital. And we just released a report on startup funding where we showed that globally startup funding has gone down by more than 50% if you compare the quarter that we just exited uh, to the same quarter last year. But interestingly, in the same period of time, uh, if you could compare the same two quarters, crowdfunding has gone up globally and especially in the Europe uh, zone. Uh, we've seen a strong growth in crowdfunding while all other forms of startup funding has actually gone down. Um, and in, in Estonia, in Oh, I thought this one was going out. Okay, so uh, ah, the slides weren't updated, sorry. Um, all right, I'll go back here. Uh, just to talk about the specific uh, market in, in Estonia, uh, we have maybe five like key companies uh, operating in different forms of, of lending and, and crowd investment. Uh, and it's, I think, as I understand it so far, that it's quite similar to here. It's, it's a relatively small market it's very tightly knit, everyone knows each other, and everyone has a very, very close relation to, to the regulators. And particularly also in Funderbeam, this is what we really, really enjoy in Estonia, is it's a small, uh, it's a small country and we have a very personal connection. So we're not trying to pass stuff by the regulator, we're working together with the regulator to create the best possible situation for, for us and other companies and for the country as a whole. Um, and, and if I were to give an advice to, to Lithuania, it would be that, that foster that close co like collaboration between the companies and the regulator uh, because that's, that's the way that you get the solutions that, of course, you need to, to protect the, the private consumers, um, but doing that will, is also empowering them to invest in great companies. Um, and this is my first time in, in Lithuania, and I think within an hour of, of getting on the, off the plane uh, yesterday, I was talking to the regulators. So I have the feeling that it's, it's, it is the same here, and that's, that's great to see. Um, this is how we structure the investments uh, on Funderbeam. You have, if you imagine this is a startup, uh, the way we do it is that all investors pool their investments into a special purpose vehicle that we call a syndicate, uh, which is managed by a lead investor. And when uh, the funding round is closed, the money is transferred from the syndicate to the startup, uh, and the syndicate then holds shares in the company. Uh, and in return, each investor is given tokens that represent a part of the loan that he or she has given to the syndicate, and these tokens are freely tradable from day one on our market. Um, so yeah, I think that's it for me. Thanks. Um, so the way that we, we decided to, to use blockchain is that we, we move a bit further away. Um, 
that with the blockchain, every single transaction is, is written to use Bitcoin blockchain, a technology called Colored Coins. So every single transaction that happens on the secondary market is written to the blockchain to a public ledger. So if you want, you can go in and you can verify every single transaction. And when, the, when a company goes public or is sold, has an exit, um, every single token that was worth initially one euro in investment knows who it belongs to. Uh, so that when we close it, it will know who to pay the money back. Um, so yeah, for transparency, uh, speed, and security. Anyone else? All right, let's sit down. Thanks. So now let's invite uh, Martins Walters, co-founder and CPO of one of the biggest Baltic peer-to-peer -peer lending marketplaces, Mintos. short story about how to develop uh, cross-border activities out of uh, Baltics. So Mintos, uh, we have built a peer-to-peer -peer lending marketplace and where investors come and they invest in loans originated by different loan originators. So this is what makes us slightly different from other peer-to-peer uh, -peer lenders, meaning that we don't deal directly with uh, borrowers. Instead, we allow loan originators who are specializing in that, who now help underwrite how to uh, find the clients. We instead, we bring uh, technology and we bring investor base. So we also can keep the fo focus on the key thing. So we started back in uh, January 2015 when we launched. We were the first uh, in, in Latvia. Since then, there have been several other platforms, some peer-to-peer -peer lenders. There have been a peer-to-peer -peer platform from uh, Estonia entering the market, some donation-based platforms, but still the in uh, industry is at the very uh, be be beginning stage. What's very promising is that uh, the government has recognized that we need uh, regulation and hence recognizing this uh, in industry. Um, when you need to develop, so uh, we often, people from Baltics, I think we uh, forget many of the advantages what we have here because they are self-evident. It's super easy to set up a company. Either it's in Latvia, it's in Lithuania, uh, in, in Estonia, or like as your uh, finance of, minister of finance told also in, in Lithuania. It is also very uh, inexpensive to get both human un and non-human resources. Uh, it's like, uh, you told, like if you do the same in, in UK, probably you end up paying like five times or even more like the, the bill. Uh, Baltic states got like a lot of talent which is related to lending and which is related to financial sector. So there are, when you look uh, across Europe, there are like very many online lending, lending companies that have uh, their roots in any of the Baltic states. So you got the knowledge here. European Union, very important to do operations cross-border, which give you credibility. And such small thing as Euro, uh, which makes the payments very easy, fast, and cheap. Basically, it doesn't matter if you make a payment within your country or it's like from Portugal or, or wherever. Uh, then we go to like the challenges, how to develop. Very often uh, people say that like you have, we have a small market. So uh, we actually think Finland is quite big, it's five million. Latvia is like two million. But then you can look at uh, uh, Europe. It is uh, 738 million people. Just to give you an impression, I actually had to make this graph 3D because otherwise it, you cannot see Latvia at all. Uh, if you would add up uh, also Baltics, it, basically makes less than 1% of the market. And this is actually the greatest thing about starting from Baltics. It means from the day one, you need to concentrate on international markets because otherwise there is not a uh, possibility to build big business if you are in, in, in FinTech. So it's actually an opportunity. A recent publication done on alternative uh, uh, lending actually confirms this uh, Estonia so we're naming them country, which is uh, ahead of us. So they have been in number one place in per capita investments. So this means that there are investments actually coming from abroad. Uh, Latvia, when we launched it back in 2015, so we are already number fifth. All the other countries from top five are also relatively small. So you can say Netherlands is not that small, but still, still small. 
where does it bring us today? Uh, how we have developed, so uh, less than two years uh, since uh, we started the operations, we got 13,000 uh, investors which are registered from uh, many countries, predominantly European uh, Union. We get loan originators, which originate loans in different countries, currently six. So we have been able to do it more internationally. And up till now, uh, 70 million euros of uh, loans have been funded in less than two years, which basically brings us in top 10 position if we include the UK or top five if we exclude UK companies. Um, what are the next challenges to continue to develop and, uh, and grow it? And when I say challenges, I actually would like to think about uh, more of them uh, of opportunities. Regulation, so uh, it's definitely a big, big opportunity. Let me say a few things about regulation. First of all, we as industry, uh, as a part of industry, we think that regulation is very uh, necessary because basically at the end of the day we are dealing with, uh, with people money. Uh, second thing, we need a reasonable regulation because the industry is still so, so small. It's very easy just like to stop the industry before you uh, allow it to, to develop. And my wish when I'm talking with uh, state and uh, uh, representatives and uh, regulators and, uh, is that I would like to have them as a mindset that first you look at what new things, what kind of opportunities they could bring and then you start thinking about risks because this is a way how to develop something. If you start, come to the first meeting and think about the risks, it's basically saying no to the development. Other challenge or uh, opportunities are uh, regular financial institutions. They have been uh, to start uh, to notice the space. And uh, there are several ways how P2P lending could uh, cooperate with, uh, uh, with, with banks. I will touch on the last uh, point, source of investment capital. This was also mentioned by, uh, in presentation by SEM banks that uh, banks, they do have access to capital. If you ju just look at the Baltic states, currently in commercial banks in deposits, there are roughly 60 billion euros. And I'm not saying that all of those 60 billion should be put in peer-to-peer -peer lending, but probably part of this money is sitting there idle and it is, its risk profile would be appropriate for peer-to-peer -peer lending. And it's a win-win situation, it's actually a win-win-win situation because the banks would win because they can, uh, their customers can be satisfied with getting uh, new products, they are paying lower capital adequacy rates with other fees. Investors are satisfied because they are not earning exactly 0% on their own part of their investment but they can get a decent return and also it's a good uh, uh, additional source for growth for, uh, for the industry. And I think every single of that is like coming quite, quite soon. Uh, and remember, Baltics is less than 1% of, of Europe. So you can do the math. Right, on that note, I would like to end my short story and open for some questions. What was the second question? First one I asked. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if you look at the investors, they definitely they want higher yields. The loan originators can offer like lower yields and. This is really a beauty of the marketplace because this is like where there is uh, demand and, uh, and supply. Just to give you an example, so uh, there were like some of the loan originators that were placing loans, let's say at 12%, and uh, this was like when they decreased the rate from 13. Then the investors were writing to us and uh, why the rate is decreased, well, it's market. After some time, this loan originator didn't put like additional loans, the same investors were writing where are the loans and they are willing to buy them at uh, lower rates. So 
related, it's just like a, mon uh, a market, related to underwriting uh, pro process. In our model, it is not really directly uh, influenced because all the loan originators, they underwrite the loans and they prefund the loans from their own uh, money. So this is only an option for them to place the loans on our platform and uh, attract uh, investors. So when they underwrite their own, uh, the loans, they think of it as they, that they could keep it in their books forever. So uh, it doesn't have direct impact. We have there one question. Do you hear me? Yeah, no. Yeah. Matti from EBRD, um, the European Bank. We heard earlier today, um, I think it was um, Marius from Nextory who, was, who told how he's trying to open an account in London, mm. uh, a bank account. Well, I've had one for 35 years, I think, <laughs> and they still want to have a copy of my passport, and they still want to have it verified by the Finnish embassy here, and they still want to have a proof of my address in, in Vilnius. Now the question to you then is, is that if you have 16,000 investors, mm -hmm. how do you make sure that these are all proper investors? I mean, uh, that's to me, if I had any dirty money, which I sadly don't, but if I had, that would be a perfect way of, of sort of uh, making it clean. Mm -hmm. So you need, I, I guess you need quite a lot of um, bodies to, to sort of make sure that all the 16,000 investors are proper investors. Mm -hmm. So first of all, is that it, uh, according to local legislations, it is uh, possible to verify uh, identity of the borrower by receiving the first payment to, to the bank. So none of the investors can make any investment before they have made uh, a, a first transfer, which solves a lot of uh, problems, at least a lot of work for private individuals. If we have a company which is investing, then of course we get like additional uh, resources, uh, additional human work to, uh, to verify the information. Hmm? And the last yeah. question? I'm actually concerned from the other side. You're saying that you get the loan from loan originators. Uh, how, if I'm an investor in your platform, my initial concern will be, okay, they will keep for themselves in the book the great loans mm -hmm. and they will try to give somebody else the bad loans. So in other words, how can you make sure that they do not do that uh, uh, mechanism and actually transferring to you whatever they don't want to keep on their books? Mm -hmm. Okay, G good question. So there are like various things how like we ma manage this risk. So uh, for some of the loans, there is something what we call a buyback guarantee, which means that the uh, loan originator would need to buy back the loan from the investor if the borrower uh, defaults. So this kind of limits this incentives. For the loans where there are uh, no such buyback guarantee, so we do a, a monitoring, we do a review of their loan books. There always will be a fraud risk, but there are like ways how you can uh, manage it. It's what I said, like you, you need to look for the opportunities and what benefits could we bring, and then you can look how, how to manage those risks, because there's always a way how, how to manage the risk. Thank you. Thank you. And last but not least, Vito Tosabulis from Savit, the first Lithuanian peer-to-peer -peer consumer lending platform. Hello. How are you today? It's, uh, it's a pleasure to stand here today. After two years, we... Okay, okay, okay. Uh, after two years, we... Less than two years that we launched uh, our platform and basically started this whole... Uh, whole cooperation with the National Bank Minister of Finance and Sorainen uh, that helped uh, in the way of, of actually making this whole process legal. I will be very short actually, I don't want to, uh, to speak more, uh, let's keep, uh, let, let, let's have some time for the panel discussion and I will be very, very short in, in what we do and what are our recommendations basically for the, for the regulators here. So, yeah. Um, if you executive summary, we, uh, we launched uh, less than two years ago. We originated uh, more than five million euros of uh, loans. Uh, that's on our back, like we originated for the borrowers. We didn't sell the claims like Mintos does. Uh, it's a totally different model. So actually our whole process takes, uh, the, the main principle that we do is we screen for, for quality borrowers. 
Um, the um, registered investors are al almost 11,000. Not all of them are active, but uh, it's, it's quite a big number also. Um, the current yield is, is, is average interest rate 25. Uh, the yield is slightly less, uh, but again, it's, it's uh, less than two years. And uh, we started with consumer loans, and we uh, uh, added two more products. It's HELOX, Home Equity Line of Credit, and uh, loans backed by real estate. So just the same, uh, the same uh, Cambridge uh, report about where the market is globally. Some of you definitely know this, some of you not. So this is the overview of the world. Basically, you see the China and the Asian Pacific that is huge. Then in the middle is Americas, and the Europe is very small with 5 billion. Then uh, uh, what we see is how the, how the actually Europe looks like. We have five platforms. Uh, Latvia says it's two. I think we have more, three probably, at least three. Um, but anyway, we, we are somewhere near the right border of Europe. This is Europe. It's five billion a year worth of market with UK. And UK is worth alone four billion. So Europe actually is only 1 billion euros worth of, of the markets. It's relatively small. So how does the loan market look in Lithuania? We have five platforms. Four of them is peer-to-peer -peer lending platforms. We are the first one and the largest. Um, then we have one new claim trading platform started last, last month. Probably it will grow to a crowdfunding platform, but we will see. Uh, and um, we are very small. In comparison with the market, which is also very small, 200 million euros worth of loan, loan uh, consumer loans, uh, the peer-to-peer -peer market takes only 4%, where we take uh, two, two and a half. So basically, this is the pie chart of how, how the consumer loan market looks like. Um, the, the SME uh, alternative SME market looks less, uh, but, but, but worse than uh, consumer loans. We have uh, almost 9 billion euros worth of market. Um, I got this information from the, from the, from the market players uh, here. And uh, the alternative market is only 10 million. So it's zero. Our Excel just rounded it to zero. So there's no alternative market at all. At all. Where from 10 million uh, loans, 5 million is, uh, is basically alternative invoice financing and VAT refund. It's less than 5 million, and almost 5 million is, is uh, like regular SME loans. We have nine business vendors that we call not uh, banks, not credit unions, and we think that this number will grow up to uh, around 15 in the end of the year. Probably it will go up even more next year, and then it has to go down because the market is too, too big, uh, too, too small for, for so many uh, different fragmented players. So anyway, we... We thought, okay, how, how can we assess the possible market from here, from Lithuania? And we made a couple of calculations. So on the, on the, on the top, you can see um, what would happen if we would take the compounded annual growth rate from, from current year to 2012, 20. On the bottom, we just took the possible loan size in the market, and we said the P2P market will take 5%. It's only consumer market. So, the, the, you, you can see that the Baltics might be 220 to 230 million euros worth of market if we take the compounded annual growth rate. And if we take the possible market size, it could be 100 million. So we took it for Baltics, Nordics, Germany, Romania, Europe, and UK and United States. And we said, okay, what would happen in different scenarios? So on the top, you can see that we took the middle point, midpoint of two possible uh, market sizes. Basically, it's, it's in the middle. So we, we think that the Baltics, the market in the Baltics in 2020 could be uh, almost 160 million euros. The Nordics, 2 billion. Germany, 6 billion. And we said, okay, what would happen if we have 1%, 2%, 5%, 10%, 15 and 20%? So you see here the scenario that we would like to have, it's, it seems big when you, you take 20% of the Baltic countries, but in the end of the day, it's only 2 million worth of, you, two million worth of loan originations a month. So 2020, we might think that we or some group of companies that we maybe will be owning uh, might have this monthly originations 
a, a month. So it's not a big market. In the end of the day, it's, it's not a big market, but to, to do that, we think that we need to accomplish a lot because we are right, right in the end of the chart. Martin said that Latvia, Estonia is in the front. You see Estonia just second from the UK. Latvia is fifth. It's per capita. Lithuania is one euro per capita, all the peer-to-peer -peer market. So we are very small. So our basic recommendation for the for the regulators and for the for the market is very simple. We need we don't uh, need to copy everything what is happening in in EU. The um, traditional peer-to-peer -peer model is not working as people anticipated two years ago. It's not working. So we need to create our own regulation. We need to create our own approach to this alternative market uh, scene. Um, we shouldn't uh, over-regulate it. We have peer-to-peer -peer lending market in Lithuania is the, the most strict regulated financial services in Lithuania. So we have more requirements than anyone else. Um, so that's, that's very, uh, um, very important to understand. We don't face any systemic risk to the financial services. We're just like 4% of the market of consumer, non-bank consumer market. It's much less if we take the banking sector as a whole. And uh, one of the main recommendations to the banks and, and traditional, uh, traditional sector and traditional sector is to start changing clients and their data. So the accounts, the banking accounts will, create, will become a commodity and uh, alternative sector should use this commodity in assessment, assessing risk and maybe getting the clients from the bank. It's very important to either force the banks here in Lithuania because they are not willing to, to do it now, either to cooperate with them and to receive the data from, their, uh, from, from, the, from the bank accounts of the consumers. On the then, we can have really good credit risk assessment because otherwise we will be slow, we will be assessing risk very uh, without, without lack of da data, and uh, that could lead to defaults and uh, angry investors and not very favorable environment in the end of the day. And um, yeah, basically that's it. I don't want to be you know, too, too, too talking here, and uh, if you have any questions, please let me know. So uh, basically, we are running out of time. So the last question for all the panelists, uh, please stop. And it will be the same. Since we are talking about crowdfunding and what we hear that the small countries like Baltics, Scandinavian countries, like they have small markets. And the problem is funding, capital, how to get it. Like we saw that Mintos took different approach. It expanded to Europe, Lhasa, establish a cross-border platform. But uh, to show the community uh, that it's necessary to open gates to the funding, which is necessary, please just shortly tell what's the benefit of crowdfunding and what, if we increase the benefit to the community, to the economy, what can we achieve? How we can uh, engage other uh, institutional finance, institutional capital and traditional banking to cooperate with you guys? My, my approach to crowdfunding would be that um, imagine the company going to raise the capital from traditional VC or traditional funding, funding uh, institutions. So these guys are mostly evaluating your financials. But if you're raising money from the crowd, from the public, they are also measuring your reputation, the brand, and the value of the brand in the society. So they, they can actually pay you a premium for this that the traditional institutions wouldn't do any, 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 any time. Um, the obvious benefit is that like, uh, there's like a situation that there's so much money and there's so much need for money, but there's no good channel how to put this money to those who, who need it. And that's a very short <coughs> Yeah, exactly. and, and also it's, it's the, the classic thing is that when you, when you make people who don't have necessarily a lot of money to invest, but still just some money that they invest, they become ambassadors to your brand and they become your strongest promoters. If they're not already users, they certainly will be. Um, and, and the real thing, that the reason why Thunderbeam has, has decided that we need trading is that 
we really see that crowdfunding solved the problem, uh, the one barrier, financial barrier to investing, which is the ticket size, the amount of money. But the second problem is that if you don't, if you're not a high income individual who does repeat investments, you can like tie down your money for five, six, seven, nine years before there's an exit. So you need that opportunity to be able to choose how long and how much. And, and that's really what it's all about. It's empowering people to support ideas that they believe in. Um, for the company's, for the company's point of view, I, I think the, I mean, the, I mean, raising funding is easy, but then also you get the marketing benefit, as as was mentioned here before. So I think that's the two things. If if you do IPO, if you go to secondary uh, secondary market, then you get the visibility right away. But now you don't need to go there. You can actually do crowdfunding and get the same benefits. So that's that's one very powerful message for for companies, for investors. I, it's basically easy easy way and you can actually do the investment in a matter of minutes so it's, it's investment done very easy um, and what we recommend to our uh, investors is that put five to ten percent of your investable portfolio uh, put it to this kind of non-listed companies and still dis still sort of um, uh, diversify the risk and put it to like I don't know 10 to 20 different uh, targets and that could actually be a very good uh, source of better additional returns. People do invest in, I don't know, uh, funds in Southeast Asia as well. Why not in your own turf or own backyard? Um, I'll speak a little bit from real estate perspective. So um, the benefits, um, as I mentioned, for sponsors, obviously it's uh, um, access to capital is for companies raising money and quick process, but um, for the investor um, from real estate, um, again, this is for someone who is doesn't have money or cannot in, invest directly into real estate. This is essentially diversification benefit. So direct real estate has um, completely different risk return um, characteristics of your stock and bond portfolio and probably other listed companies. So these platforms allow these individuals to do so. Thank you. Uh, so what we hear that uh, it's a tool. It's a tool helping society to solve the problem of financing. So to sum up, I would like to invite all of you to start using the new crowdfunding platforms we will have to start raising funds through the platforms and regulators, policymakers to foster crowdfunding because it's essential uh, tool solving the gap in the financing cycle in the Baltics especially. Thank you.